All right. Hello. My name is Davin Waite, and if you're tuning in right now, you have found a digital lecture from the Historical and Cultural Society of Clay County. Uh, tonight, HCSCC Senior Archivist Mark Peel will explore the stories of Algona Branch Camp 1, Moorhead's World War II German POW Camp. Before we begin, uh, let me first thank you all for joining us tonight. At HCS, we view these digital lectures as central to our mission of sharing Clay County history. Your support as museum visitors and even watching these lectures at home helps us uh, do just that. If you'd like to support us further, please consider joining us as a member or participating in future events. You'll find the details to do either of those at our website at www dot hcscc online dot org. Uh, finally, if you have questions for Mark uh, during the talk tonight, uh, please feel free to type those into the chat section on Zoom uh, or the comment section on Facebook, and we will hold a moderated Q&A session at the end. With that, I will turn it over to Mark. Mark, the microphone is yours. Okay, thanks, Devin. Appreciate it. Um, well, yeah, as Stephen said, I'd like to talk tonight about a little known aspect of World War II home front history, and that's our prisoner of war camp uh, here in Moorhead. Uh, two seasons, 1944-1945, scores of uh, German prisoners worked on local farms around here. When I was doing research for this project years ago, I spoke to many people who had lived in Moorhead all throughout the war, and they didn't know that there was a prisoner of war camp here. Uh, it wasn't particularly hidden, but uh, it didn't call attention to itself either. Now, during the Second World War, the U.S. took an awful lot of prisoners. Eventually, there were over 400,000 that were housed here in the United States. Uh, the vast majority were Germans, some Italians, uh, very few Japanese. Uh, the Japanese didn't surrender by and large, and, and of those that did, uh, most of them were kept overseas in Australia and India, uh, New Zealand, um, the only ones really brought to the United States were uh, prisoners that uh, the War Department figured had high intelligence value that, that we could extract information from. Uh, so relatively few Japanese here in the United States. Uh, it, at, the, at the first part of the war, the United States uh, tried to keep them in Europe. During the First World War, the British took care of almost all of our prisoners. Uh, we tried to do that in the Second World War, but after an Allied successes in North Africa and later on in Sicily and Italy, there got to be so many prisoners that uh, the British couldn't handle them all, and they had to start bringing them here to the United States very late in 1942. Eventually, there were over 650 Maine and branch camps in 44 of the uh, 48 states at the time. Uh, at first, uh, they tried to keep the camps down in the deep south and in the desert southwest, Basically, for economic reasons, they didn't have to heat the barracks. It was cheaper to keep them there. But eventually, they uh, uh, spread all over the country, including here in Minnesota. Now, also during the World, World War II, there was a tremendous labor shortage. So many guys going off to service and other people going to oh, the West Coast to work in war industries and, and whatnot. That uh, by the fall of 1942, the first harvest season after the beginning of the United States entering hostilities, uh, by the 1942 harvest season, the labor situation had gotten so critical that farm, local farmers here in the valley had to rely on students to go out and actually pick their heart crops for them. Uh, uh, Co-eds like these young gals from NDAC, NDSU today, high school kids had uh, what they called harvest holidays, and they'd let the kids out. And it looked as if by 1943, the situation was going to become even more dire. Uh, so people started looking, you know, we've got all these prisoners of war here, you know, why don't we put those guys to work? Now, the Geneva Convention in 1929 was the international treaty that governed the treatment of prisoners of war during the Second World War. And it, according to the Geneva Accords, it was perfectly all right to order privates uh, to uh, do uh, work in civilian industries as long as they weren't involved in dangerous jobs or jobs directly related to the war effort. Uh, so working on farms and things like that, it was perfectly all right. You could order the privates to work, uh, the non-coms, non, uh, the uh, sergeants and corporals, basically non-commissioned officers, they could be, uh, they could work if they wanted to. 
Uh, and this is an important consideration. The United States is the only belligerent, the only country involved in the war to follow the Geneva Convention to the letter. Now, that was an important decision that was made by the War Department early in the war. Uh, they expect, they hoped that it, if we treated our prisoners decently here in the United States, it might result in better treatment for American prisoners overseas. Uh, there are some historians who believe that the War Department is being naive about that. Uh, other historians suggest that there is evidence that uh, uh, it did mitigate uh, Germans' uh, treatment of American prisoners. Um, I'm not so sure, uh, but uh, at one point, uh, the Assistant Provost Marshal General, uh, during a period when uh, the War Department was being taken to task for model co coddling the, these prisoners, treating them way too decent, uh, he suggested that, uh, you know, Americans don't punish a guy for doing something some other guy did. And he basically was saying that, you know, we're Americans, we're better than that. And I can't think of a better reason, really, to uh, follow the Geneva Convention to the, to the letter. Even Canada and Britain, our closest allies, uh, had these guys working in munition plants and hard rock mining in clear violation of the Geneva Convention. The US government contracts uh, for the prisoner labor in the fall of 1943 proved successful. Uh, and eventually here in Minnesota, they wound up working in the timber industry, canning peas down in Southeast Minnesota, and particularly uh, in agriculture, working on farms across the whole of the state. In 1944, Paul, these two fellows, Paul Horn and Hank Peterson, two very big farmers here in Clay County, uh, applied for 150 prisoners to work on their two farms uh, in the spring of 1944. Uh, these guys uh, specialized in labor intensive crops like sugar beets, potatoes, onions, uh, vegetables, and uh, they really were, were in the hurt bag for, uh, for laborers by 1944. All of the prisoners that worked in uh, Minnesota and North, Eastern North and South Dakota and Iowa came from one main camp, uh, a base camp at a place called Algona, Iowa. Algona was in North Central Iowa, just south of the Minnesota border. There were thousands of German and Italian prisoners that were held there during the war. And from there, branch camps were established all over Iowa, Minnesota and the Dakotas. Um, you're here in the Red River. There are 21 branch camps in Minnesota alone. Down in Southeast Minnesota, uh, there were a couple of camps that uh, housed Italian prisoners who worked in the canning industry, canning peas down in Lesur, Minnesota, for instance. Um, and uh, up in Northern Minnesota, uh, there were four camps where the prisoners cut timber at Bina and Deer River and Grand Rapids and Reamer, Minnesota. But here in the Red River Valley, of course, they all worked on farms and that, uh, uh, there was a camp in Moorhead, of course, uh, but there were also large but very short-lived camps in the fall of 1945 at Crookston and Warren and Ada uh, and in North Dakota at Grand Forks and Grafton. And I'll talk more about those here in a little bit. Well, once the contracts are approved, the first order of business is to try to find a barracks for these characters. We had to have a place for them to, they had to, have a place for them to stay. Uh, the U.S. Army sent out a crew of surveyors and they looked around at different op options. And they selected this brand new horse barn just recently been created uh, down on what's now Elm Street and 12th Avenue South, just down southwest of Concordia on the river down there. Uh, it's been renovated into housing. There's a family that lives there now, but in 1944, it was a, it was a horse barn. Uh, the prisoners are all about ready to move in. The War Department is ready to ship the prisoners up. And the neighbors started to complain. They said, well, it's inside city limits. And technically, well, they just didn't want it in their neighborhood. That's what it came down to, basically. And the, uh, the War Department was not about to get involved in a neighborhood dispute. So uh, they were ready to pull the prisoners, send them someplace else. Finally, Paul Horn, at the last minute, really came up with this onion warehouse at 324 21st Street North, uh, belonged to the Clay County Cooperative Onion Growers Association. And uh, that eventually became the prisoner's home. That was became the barracks. And uh, uh, 21st Street is the street that runs north and south in front of the Coca-Cola bottling plant, if you know where that is in, in Eastern, in Moorhead. So this uh, uh, onion warehouse was about two and a half blocks north of the Coke plant on the east side of 21st Street. 
The building is actually still there. Uh, this is what it looks like today. It's been uh, altered substantially. There's no loading dock. The rail facilities are gone. And, uh, but this is the, the, uh, the home for those prisoners in those two years. The prison camp had an official name. It was the first camp established out of, branch camp established out of Algona. So it was Algona branch camp number one. Uh, the first 40 prisoners arrived by rail from uh, Algona on May 28th, 1944. First couple of nights, they stayed in tents down on the Horn Farm, which was right about where I-94 crosses the Red River today. Uh, and uh, a couple of days later, 110 more arrived. And uh, the whole contingent marched from the depot, the Northern Pacific Railway Depot, downtown Moorhead, out to the camp. It must have been quite a sight. Middle of World War II, and you got 150 German soldiers marching down the middle of Center Avenue. And a young... A uh, lieutenant from Kentucky, Richard Blair, was in charge. He had a, an, a medic and a sergeant working for him and about a dozen guards. Uh, there was a two-acre compound surrounded by an eight-foot wire fence. Uh, there were, I've seen plans for a guard tower, but they were, it was never installed. Uh, the prisoners did the labor out there preparing the, the site for, uh, for their uh, camp. They put in the water, electricity, and sewer, and uh, the War Department, of course, paid for all the materials. This is an aerial photograph that was taken after the war in 1948 uh, that shows the area basically. Um, uh, the street running north and south through the middle of the picture, that's 21st Street, and you can see where the Onion Warehouse is located. And that area that's kind of tinted in yellow, that's probably about the, the two acre compound that was enclosed by uh, that eight foot wire fence. This is the camp gate. It was a two-stage gate. Uh, the idea was you'd open up the outer gate, let the prisoners in, close and lock the gate behind them, and then open up the inner gate. That way you wouldn't have a, an open gate available for prisoners to go streaming through and run out and create mayhem. They were trucked to the field six days a week, uh, worked 10 hours a day. Uh, I asked Roy Schultz about this. Sergeant Roy Schultz was uh, second in command in 1944 at Moorhead and uh, I uh, asked him what his, his day was like, and he said it was pretty boring duty. He laughed, and he said he would, they'd, he'd load these guys onto trucks in the, in the morning, uh, ride with them out to the fields, and then all day he'd lay underneath a truck with an M1 carbine watching these guys work, load them up on the trucks at the end of the day, and hold them back into town at night. And they did, he did that six days a week all summer long. Paul Horn and Hank Peterson are interviewed by folks over at MSUM uh, in the 1970s. And uh, they said that uh, a lot of the prisoners weren't terribly interested in working, actually. Uh, but even those that did uh, uh, could only produce about 65% of what they could expect from migrant labor from South Texas. Uh, the contractors paid the War Department for these guys' time. Uh, according to the Geneva Convention and federal law, uh, the, the War Department had to pay uh, or rather the contractors had to pay for the prisoners labor at the going rate for ag labor in Clay County during World War II, which uh, was determined to be 40 cents an hour. Uh, so the contractors paid the War Department 40 cents an hour for these guys labor, but the prisoners received only 10 cents of that. And they got it in the form of coupons like these, which could be redeemed only at the camp uh, canteen uh, and where they could get uh, candy and uh, uh, oh, uh, cigarettes, razor blades, and beer. They could get 3.2% alcohol beer there. And uh, actually, the, the federal government uh, took the other 30 cents to pay for their upkeep and their maintenance, their housing and their food. Uh, and actually, in 1944, the federal government netted a profit of $13,000 off these guys' labor during the course of that summer. They did other things too. They did some barn shingling. This is what these prisoners are doing right here. See the guard up there with the 45 watching over these guys. Equipment repair and operating. Uh, uh, according to federal law, the prisoners were not supposed to operate heavy equipment. Uh, but this guy sitting here on the tractor, uh, his name was Hans Kerrer, and Kerrer was a farmer in Germany before the war. And he could not believe the equipment that we had here in the United States. And uh, he was just nuts to drive the tractor. And uh, so they let him. There are no real problems, discipline problems at the camp. Uh, I spoke to uh, Florence Drury, Florence uh, Peterson Drury, or Probesfield Drury, was uh, the bookkeeper of the Peterson Farm uh, that first year in 1944. 
And she worked in the office and she said a lot of times these guys had have some sort of problem. They'd have to get straightened out and they'd have to come into the office. Some of them speak pretty good English and she got to know several of them quite well. And uh, she said, if it wasn't for the PW that was painted on their clothes, their work clothes, you couldn't tell that they were prisoners. They just looked like American guys walking around. So she did pick out these three guys as real Nazi types, uh, especially this guy in the middle. She said they'd, he'd strut around like with his chest out like he was Superman. Uh, these guys are captured early in the war. They're part of the Africa Corps, an elite unit in North Africa. And uh, uh, they just didn't believe the stories that other prisoners who were captured later told them about how the German army was collapsing on the Western Front and uh, the Russians are closing and just thought it was American propaganda. There were a couple of minor discipline issues and September 1944, the prisoners were upset about a couple of things that were going on and they held a sit down strike. Uh, a couple of prisoners took a sledgehammer to the pump, uh, camp pump and broke it. And both cases, uh, the ringleaders wound up in the Clay County Jail for a few nights and it was much less pleasant accommodations than they had at the camp. Uh, there were no escape attempts, no escape attempts. I asked Roy Schultz about that and he said, those guys didn't know where the hell they was. Out in the middle of Minnesota, uh, no way to get back home. And besides, these guys were extremely well treated. They had no reason to try to want to escape. Um, there were a couple of uh, escape, some escape attempts from uh, Minnesota camps, none from Moorhead. Uh, probably the closest one to become successful, if you can call it that, happened up at uh, Bina. Uh, there were a couple of prisoners up in northeastern Minnesota, this camp. Uh, and their plan, if they, if you can call it that, uh, they planned to take a rowboat when the ice broke up on the on the Mississippi River in the spring and float to New Orleans. Okay, they were going to float from Minnesota to New Orleans and uh, try to find a neutral vessel at the port of New Orleans, or make their way to Mexico, and either way, uh, make it back, make it back to Germany. Uh, well, <laughs> they, these guys made it 13 miles in five days before they gave themselves up. Uh, and there weren't any neutral vessels in New Orleans Harbor, and uh, Mexico was on our side. These guys are messed up from the beginning. This is Harvey Fleshner. Harvey was the medic at the camp in 1944, and uh, he turned uh, 23 years old that summer, and the prisoners baked him this cake, and he said it was a damn good cake, too. Uh, there's a good question of, you know, in 1944, where did they get the, the sugar? and uh, the, the flour for this cake. Uh, I mean, those are restricted items, they were rationed. And uh, the, according to the Geneva Convention, the prisoners are supposed to get the same rations as American GIs. And uh, that meant that in the spring of 1944, at Easter, some prisoners at some camps apparently received ham. And again, that was a restricted meat and uh, that really blew into a big stink in 1944. Uh, so uh, later on, the War Department changed their tune and they said, okay, instead of giving the same rations as American GIs, these guys would receive the same number of calories. And they started getting ham hocks and uh, pig jowls and things like that. And a lot more vegetables and fruits and bread. And ironically, it was probably a better diet for them. You gotta keep these guys busy too. You get a bunch of young guys sitting around uh, not doing anything, You're getting, they're gonna get into trouble. Uh, the Red Cross and the YMCA did inspections of the camp, and uh, they brought in books and magazines for these guys, writing materials, musical instruments, uh, arts and craft supplies. Uh, this is uh, Hans Kerr, that uh, uh, a prisoner that I mentioned before, and he used a wood carving kit to cut the carve these two plaques, these two decorative wooden plaques for uh, Florence Drury, the uh, bookkeeper at the Peterson Farm. And uh, Florence was an attractive young woman. She wasn't married at the time. And Carrier apparently thought she should be having babies. The, the plaque on the left uh, shows a stork delivering a little baby. This is Richard Blair. Uh, he was in charge of the camp the first year, 1944. Uh, uh, everybody that I talked to that knew him uh, really liked him. He was a charming, funny guy. He had a thick Kentucky accent. This is... Uh, Drury Florence uh, said she could barely understand him sometimes. Uh, he was real popular with the contractors, but he was not universally admired. Uh, he wasn't a strict disciplinarian, uh, let the, the prisoners uh, ride in the cabs of trucks against uh, federal law. Uh, 
Um, he let Hank Peterson take some of the prisoners down to movies on Sunday afternoons down at the uh, Moorhead Theater. And Blair took the prisoners uh, for swimming expeditions out to the Buffalo River State Park and the Benedict Gravel Pit, which was a popular swimming hole southeast of, of Moorhead. And in June 1944, a prisoner named Franz Hummer drowned out at the Benedict Pit. There was a coroner's jury called and uh, they ruled that uh, since the prisoners had been warned that the water was deep and there weren't any, any lifeguards for them, uh, uh, Blair didn't re receive any responsibility for it. Uh, he was sent back to Algona uh, for burial with full military honors. And then after the war, his body was disinterred and he was reinterred and he's buried today at Fort Riley, Kansas Military Cemetery. He was the only Minnesota prisoner to die in a camp. There was another famous incident where Hank Peterson took a couple of the prisoners down to the Magic Aquarium Bar in downtown Moorhead and bought him a few beers. And that did not go over well with uh, locals, uh, raised some hackles, but uh, Blair escaped uh, anything there. But in August of 1944, Blair started going around and speaking to service, local service clubs. This is the Fargo Rotary Club's Rotary Wheel, their weekly newsletter. And uh, uh, it mentioned that uh, Richard Blair had been invited to come speak about the camp at Moorhead uh, to the club. And uh, uh, he, he, afterwards, people asked him what his own personal feelings were about the German people, and he just went off. He said they're cocky and arrogant. They're deeply resentful of being penned up behind barbed wire. They feel they're the superior race. Not much salvage value among the German people. And Germany is going to have to be dealt with very firmly for years to come, he said. And, of course, this got back to his superiors down in Algona, and he got fired. Uh, War Department said that uh, uh, Blair has a penchant for addressing civic organizations of prisoner of war matters, and he's not properly versed in War Department policies to be entrusted with such public appearances. So Lieutenant uh, Bertram Davis, another young lieutenant, took his place. Uh, things ran a lot smoother after that, actually. Uh, Davis instituted some real uh, strict controls. Uh, when November, uh, harvest was finished in November, the prisoners returned to Algona for the winter. The following year, 1945, uh, of course, Germany was defeated that spring, and uh, the prisoners weren't actually prisoners of war anymore, but they were still the responsibility of the War Department. The War Department made the decision to uh, keep the prisoners here in the United States and keep them working uh, until uh, Japan surrendered. And that didn't happen, of course, until September 1945. Uh, there were 45 prisoners, a much smaller group arrived in July of that year. Uh, Hank Peterson and Horn really didn't need 150 prisoners. They subcontracted them out to other farmers in the area. Uh, in, in 1945, um, Sergeant Olaf Tishhammer was in charge. Uh, he was an older than average a uh, soldier. He was a World War I vet from Nebraska, and uh, he could speak German. That helped communication considerably. Uh, the POWs were allowed to work without guards. And, uh, the compound fence was not needed anymore, so they took it down. And uh, they had pretty strict rules for the contractors and uh, better discipline for the prisoners. Uh, things went a lot smoother in 45. Uh, all the POWs returned to Algona in late October after harvest was done. And all the U.S. camps were closed by July of 1946, and they were sent to Europe. Prisoners were sent to Europe. Um, uh, that didn't necessarily mean they went to Germany. Uh, Britain and France decided that since Germany had started the war, uh, Britain, uh, they owed them a lot of money. So one of the ways they tried to extract that was through the labor of these prisoners. So they put these guys to work uh, in hard rock mining and all sorts of other uh, uh, difficult, nasty tasks uh, for months, in some cases years it was, before some of these prisoners made it back to uh, their homes in Germany. I mentioned the harvest camps in 1945 in the Northern Valley. The Northern Valley labor situation is absolutely critical by the fall of 1945. It was a really a wet spring, and uh, uh, the farmers weren't able to get their crops into the field until late. By the time the potatoes and sugar beets are ready for harvest, all of the migrant workers who normally would have harvested those crops had moved on and they were harvesting crops in other parts of the country. Uh, so the situation is really quite dire and a lot of uh, farmers and 
petitioned the, uh, the federal government to send them some prisoners. And there were some short-lived camps just in October and November of 1945, uh, but very large ones. Uh, Ada received uh, 200 Germans and they were housed at the Norman County Fairgrounds. Uh, Cookston, Cookston uh, almost 400 at the Winter Sports Arena. Uh, at Warren, Minnesota, there were 220 Italians that came to work and uh, uh, they asked for 500, 220 was all they were able to get. And uh, they were housed at a, at a former Bible camp up there at Warren. Likewise, uh, there were large short-lived camps at Grafton and at, at Grand Forks, North Dakota as well. And, and Colonel uh, Albert Lob, uh, Arthur Lobdahl, who was in charge of the uh, camp at Algona, said after the war that um, uh, had it not been for the prisoner of war labor in northern Minnesota in 1945, a third of the potato and sugar beet crop would have rotted in the field, and that would have been worth close to $2 million. Uh, in the fall of 1944, uh, the uh, War Department started something they called the Intellectual Diversion Program. Uh, in Ottawa 1944, um, they started uh, distributing magazines, carefully selected books, movies, uh, lectures, uh, all designed to instill an appreciation for American style democracy. Uh, in preparation for these guys going back to Germany, uh, hoping that after the war they would develop uh, uh, dem a democratic regime in, in Germany. And some authorities believe that the intellectual diversion program influenced enough uh, former prisoners that it influenced the development of democracy in Western Germany, at least West Germany at any rate. But it's hard to imagine that uh, the program had any greater impact on the prisoners than just their humane, decent treatment on here in the United States by Peterson and Horn and by actually by the War Department, the US government. After the war, many prisoners wrote to Peterson and Horn, in some cases asking them for any kind of assistance they could offer, any kind of care package they could send them there. Uh, many cases, their families are all gone, their homes are demolished and they had, the economy was in shambles. Uh, other prisoners uh, asked for help to come to the United States to become American citizens. But, but most of the prisoners uh, who wrote to Peterson Horn uh, wrote just to thank them for their kind, humane treatment that they received here. Uh, Helmut Langenbach in 1946 wrote to Hank Peterson uh, this letter, and it's a long one, but I'll just quote a little bit. He said, today I'll thank you again through my letter. We've not only been good workmen, we've good, been good fellows too. Every man likes you and I will never forget your truck farm. There were two prisoners of war that wrote to Peterson that said the best times of their lives were the months that they spent working as prisoners of war here in Minnesota. And that's pretty amazing that you compare and contrast that with uh, uh, the way our people were treated overseas. And with that, I'm, I'm done. If anybody has any questions, uh, Devin, are you there? Any questions? Yeah, we got uh, let's see here. Yeah, we have a couple questions I've written down. Okay. Um, so you mentioned that some of these um, POWs wrote to Peterson and maybe Horn um, asking for help to move to the U.S. Is there any is there any evidence that any of these folks actually eventually moved to the U.S.? Well, the best book on the subject is written by a fellow named Arnold Kramer, uh, Nazi prisoners of war in America. And he says, and he speculates in there, there were probably somewhere around 5,000 uh, German prisoners uh, who eventually came back to the United States. Um, I know for, for one, um, I was doing this program for a, a group a number of years ago and a guy told me afterwards, he said that uh, uh, back in the 1970s, he was in Houston in a uh, hotel uh, and he was sitting in the bar and he got to talking to another fellow and he said he was from Moorhead, Minnesota. And this gentleman said that, oh, I was a prisoner of war in Moorhead for a few months in 1944. Uh, after the war, he'd gone back to Germany and then he had come to managed to come to the United States and was working in the petroleum industry in Texas uh, at the time it, he'd become an American citizen. So that guy certainly did. Um, uh, <laughs> oddly enough, um, uh, I, I mentioned uh, escapes. There weren't any uh, uh, any successful escapes from uh, really many successful escapes in Minnesota. Uh, 
Uh, almost all of the prisoners who escaped uh, were captured within three days. Um, uh, the vast majority, 85, 87% were captured in three days. Uh, there were a handful that made it for some time longer. Uh, as late as um, uh, 1951, yeah, 1951, there were still six prisoners who had escaped that were still at large here in the United States. And uh, every, it's interesting, every single one of those escaped after VE Day. They escaped because they wanted to stay in the United States, not because they wanted to go back to Germany. And all of these guys were captured save one. And then finally, I believe it was in the early 1980s, uh, uh, this guy turned himself over to Professor uh, Arnold Kramer that I mentioned before that wrote the book. And uh, he had been uh, successful living under an assumed name in uh, Fort uh, Collins, Colorado, and become uh, uh, married an American woman and uh, gotten a successful life going. And he eventually turned himself in. Uh, the, war, the State Department was going to send him back to Germany, but in the last minute they relented. And as far as I know, I believe he's still about, he'd be about 96 years old now, but I think he's still living in Fort Collins, Colorado. Hmm. Wow. Okay, we have a question from uh, Kim. Don't know if I got a last name there, but Kim asks, were these POWs provided with the same news uh, and information um, as the residents? Uh, in other words, you know, was there any attempt to restrict, you know, certain war reports or something like that? I, I suspect is what she's getting at. Yeah, uh, they were given carefully um, curated newspapers and books and, and lectures and things like that as part of the intellectual diversion program starting in the fall of 1944. And, um, uh, and you know, it, uh, they couldn't help but uh, overhear things, you know, radios, if they were able to speak English, and some of them could, uh, certainly radios or uh, uh, in the case of Hank Peterson taking prisoners to movies down at the uh, Moorhead Theater, there would be newsreels going on uh, before the feature presentation. So they would be getting information that way. And also uh, information from prisoners that were captured later in the war, they'd be able to get information from them. Um, and uh, how much they, they took that to heart uh, or how much they thought it was American propaganda would be up to the individual soldier and her. Um, so I have a question you know, sort of branching from that. Um, you know, we recently closed an exhibition on World War I uh, in which a, a fairly substantial part talks about um, anti-German sentiments during World War I. Um, were there attitudes in the local press or, you know, negative attitudes shared about these folks coming into Moorhead? You know, that's interesting. Um, I've talked to a number of people who, um, uh, who who knew that the camp was here during during the war, and uh, the answers are, are kind of all over the map. Uh, uh, but mostly, I think uh, probably if if I could just put it into a nutshell, I think most people were were just curious. You know, this is kind of a weird sort of a deal. We're at war with these guys, and still they're they're right here. Um, people that worked with them on a day-to-day -day basis, like uh, like Paul Horn and Hank Peterson and uh, and Florence Drury, uh, had good things to say about them. They were they were just fine, uh, and uh, uh, I'm sure other people uh, despised the the prisoners for uh, uh, what they were doing to their relatives over in 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 Europe. Uh, and so I'm, I'm sure the the answer is um, very complicated and. and more based on individual uh, experience than anything else. Sure. Uh, Paul Harris has a question here. Um, uh, depending on your knowledge of the Japanese internment camp in Bismarck, uh, do you know how, you know, the treatment of those prisoners, the conditions of the camp, uh, of the two camps compare? I don't know as much about the, the, uh, the internment camp out there as I should. Um, there's a very good book, um, uh, Snow Country, um, I'm trying to think of the name of it now, uh, 
uh, but uh, uh, a lot of the Japanese that were kept there were um, uh, for a couple of different reasons. They refused to uh, sign uh, loyalty oaths to the United States and, and renounce their allegiance to Japan. And many of them refused to do so because they had no allegiance to Japan to renounce. And uh, it was insulting to them to have to do that. So they refused to sign these these uh, these things, and they wound up going out there. Uh, there are also uh, Germans and Italians that were kept out there at, at Bismarck, uh, mostly you know, Japanese businessmen or Italian laborers or or uh, German sailors that were caught here at the beginning of the war, civilians that were caught here at the beginning of the war and couldn't go back. They, they were all stayed out there. Um, uh, but I, as far as the conditions conditions there, I. I I don't know enough to say. Let's see. Um, Neil, Neil Galt is wondering if the Africa Corps um, prisoners had been elsewhere before Moorhead. Um, um, well, they came through the Algona camp, and many of the prisoners that wound up in Algona had been at other camps, including Concordia, uh, Kansas. And Concordia, Kansas had a, a bad reputation as probably one of the worst camps uh, in, the, in the country. Um, it uh, was run pretty slackly. And uh, basically the, the commandant of the, of the camp figured that if he let the Germans run themselves, uh, it would run a lot smoother. And for his perspective, it probably did. But that meant that there was uh, a small core of really hardcore Nazis that ran the camp and uh, met out really brutal retribution against any uh, anti-Nazi or uh, uh, anybody of uh, their fellow prisoners that were considered collaborators. And uh, when that camp was shut down, uh, uh, I should step back for a second. You know, the British at first, you know, uh, took care of our prisoners at the beginning of the war, and uh, given their experience handling our, the prisoners in the First World War, when the prisoners came in, they sorted them out pretty quickly into anti-Nazi, pro-Nazi, and uh, and all those guys that were kind of just caught up in the mix in between, and they sent them to separate camps. The United States didn't do that, so uh, until later. Uh, so uh, eventually, when the problems of Concordia broke out, uh, uh, a lot of the prisoners, most of the prisoners that were sent to uh, uh, Algona were anti-Nazi or, or at least neutral about the, about the uh, uh, polit politics of the time. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Africa Corps fellows that I pointed out, they probably were not hardcore Nazis, but they were part of an elite unit. And uh, they felt themselves higher than and better than some of the other prisoners around them, and certainly more than the, than the guards that were watching over them. Uh, I got um, I got a request from Rose Anderson. You know, can you speak uh, more about Hank Peterson's daughter, uh, who went to Germany to visit prisoners that had worked on their farm? Yeah, uh, Sherry Watt. Sherry Peterson Watt uh, used to be on our board of directors, and uh, uh, she and her husband were in contact with the former prisoner that uh, that worked on her father's farm in 1945. I believe he was there, uh, and uh, I'm trying to think of his name now. I, I, uh, but uh, uh, Sherry and her husband did go over to Germany and met with him, and uh, his grandchildren, his, his uh, I believe it was his son and his uh, grandchildren. Uh, came over to visit uh, the Petersons here, in, or the Watts here in Clay County, and I got a chance to meet with them and uh, uh, talk about um, uh, their grandfather's experience and life here in, in, in Moorhead, and uh, they were able to tell me a little bit more about him and uh, uh, his experiences from, from the other perspective. Uh, he was a very young uh, soldier when he was captured shortly after D-Day. He was uh, one of those guys who was guarding the Normandy beach and uh, uh, was captured almost immediately uh, in, in very early part of the uh, Normandy invasion. Um, I, I think this is the last question. It's, it's my question. 
Um, I'm thinking about this period and, and how it's not that far off from the, the gains of the Farmer Labor Party in Minnesota, you know, and there's the still New Deal Democrats uh, and much of the federal government. Um, did labor unions or, or maybe even other farmers object in any way to this specific camp or, you know, this uh, minor influx of prison labor? Uh, I don't know about farmers, but certainly the labor unions definitely were uh, opposed to uh, uh, prisoner of war labor. It, uh, they saw that it undercut um, American workers and uh, undercut their uh, costs of thing, or the uh, prices that they may, might charge for their labor. Uh, so yeah, there was a lot of pushback, especially in northeastern Minnesota up in the timber uh, country. All right. Well, doesn't look like we have any more questions. Lots of compliments. So uh, your, your talk was much appreciated. Uh, thanks to all of you for tuning in. Um, join us next month when um, our colleague Marcus Krieger will discuss the life of Felix Battles. Um, I forget the specific date on that. I do believe it's the third Tuesday next month again, though. Uh, so I hope we see you then. Thank you. Thanks.